He's a race-baiting, xenophobic, religious bigot. He doesn't represent my party. He doesn't represent the values that the men and women who wear the uniform are fighting for. And you know how you make America great again? Tell Donald Trump to go to hell. I've seen that clip like a thousand times. Oh, I'm exaggerating. 50 times. Still really wild, right? Back in 2015, then presidential candidate Lindsey Graham, not a big fan of Donald Trump. At one point, Trump infamously retaliated by sharing Graham's private phone number at a rally, which in turn led to Graham making a big show of destroying his phone to end the harassment from angry Trump fans, and admittedly as a bit of a publicity stunt. Just a few years later, Graham was firmly on Team Trump, going so far as to assist the ex-president in his attempted coup by pressuring Georgia Republican Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger into overturning Biden's victory in the state, or at least maybe tossing out some absentee ballots he thought might help Trump get the win. It was that endeavor, of course, which led to a Georgia special grand jury recommending Graham be indicted in Fulton County, something that ultimately did not happen, likely due in large part to the logistical hurdles of indicting a sitting senator in state court. Directly after the January 6th attack, when Trump's mob stormed Graham's place of work, he, like many others, claimed he was done. But it didn't take too long before he was back on the Trump train. All I can say is uh, count me out. Enough is enough. I've tried to be helpful. I'm for Donald Trump because I know what I'm going to get. We need somebody that on day one can get this country back on track. So what exactly happened? How did Lindsey Graham go from hardline, never Trumper, to risking criminal exposure for the ex-president Briefly back to being a Never Trumper before endorsing him for his third campaign. Will Saladin is a writer for The Bulwark who has spent a year going through Lindsey Graham's archive of public statements. The end result was a book length story called The Corruption of Lindsey Graham, and he joins me now. Will, I've been enjoying uh, your, your, your case study. Um, and, and, and first, let's just start with the news out of the Fulton uh, County Grand Jury. I mean, again, he was not actually charged. But he did make these calls. And, and what's striking about them is it wasn't like one of these things where you get cornered by a microphone and you kind of have to say the line, you know, the toe the Trump line. This was done behind the scenes, affirmatively of his own volition and enterprise. This wasn't like he was pandering. And that, to me, really sticks out about what it says about him and his character. What, what do you make of it? Well, from the beginning of uh, right after the election, Lindsey Graham was engaged in a very public campaign to help Donald Trump try to overturn the results. He, he was obviously spreading. He, Lee Graham was all over Fox News. He was spreading myths and lies about about election fraud. And this call to Raffensperger was part of a campaign. Trump wanted all of his accomplices, including Graham, to be doing everything they could to try to help him overturn these state results in the key states. And this, this call to Raffensperger was Graham's version of the phone call that Trump later made right. to Raffensperger. And Trump's phone call is very explicit, right? He says, I need you to find me 11,780 votes. Graham appears to have done a much, who is, Graham is a trained lawyer and right. he's a smarter guy. <laughs> yeah. and, and he appears to have done a much smarter version of the call in which he didn't say, go find me the votes. He said, you know, Brad, what could you do about these counties where there were a lot of mail-in ballots? We don't know whether the signatures were valid. We can't prove they aren't. But, you know, is there something you could do where you could just sort of set those ballots, all the ballots, the mail-in ballots from those counties aside? So he was doing a clever version of what Trump was doing to try to undermine the result. And he managed to do it, obviously, in a way where Trump gets indicted, but Graham doesn't. Yeah, and, and let's be clear here. When, when, when he's saying that, can you set the mail-in ballots? We've got to go back to 2020, an election where we knew that the mail-in ballots were running, you know, 80, 20 or whatever they were, hugely for Biden, the in-person vote going the opposite way. So it's like you, the, 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 the categories of votes were proxies. You know what you're doing if you're asking someone to set aside mail-in ballots. Right. And, and the dispute here is, did he actually ask Raffensperger to set them aside, or did he just say sort of, you know, is this a legal thing that one could do? Because Trump is very explicit. You can hear right. in Trump's yes. phone call, I need you to do this. Graham, if he doesn't express it as an imperative, does he get away with it? And the answer is, with seven of the special grand jurors, apparently that was enough. And that was enough to deter Fannie Willis from proceeding with the Graham part of the indictment. 
You know, it's funny, when I talk to people in the world, not on television about politics, um, there's, a, there's a bunch of questions people ask. You know, one of them that comes up with some frequency is like, what's the deal with Lindsey Graham? Like, it's, it's a fairly, like, people are like, what? Like, I don't, well, I don't get it. What, was he pretending then? Is he pretending now? Like, what's, what's your theory, having basically written a, a book about this, of the answer to that question? Right. The simple answer is, there isn't a moment. There isn't some, you know, a lot of people you've heard say, oh, Trump blackmailed him. There was some golf outing where Trump, you know, told Graham he was going to spill some dark secret about Graham, and then Graham came over. That's not what happened. There's no evidence of that. What happened is a long, slow process. Remember, in the clips you played at the at 2015, Graham was trying to stop Trump from becoming the Republican nominee and from gaining power. Once Trump got the Republican nomination, Graham started to coach him on how to win the election. And then once, once Trump won the election and was going to be president, Graham wanted to influence policy. And Graham does believe in, a, in a, an internationalist interventionist foreign policy. So he wanted to have influence in Trump's White House. And he gradually just began to rationalize everything Trump did. You know, Chris, it was Trump's initiative, not Graham's. Trump did things like firing Jim Comey, right? And those, those are the things that Graham increasingly rationalized, one after another after another, so that Graham could have access to Trump's ear. I mean, today, even today, you can see when Graham is on TV, those interviews he's doing on Fox, they're not for you and me. Those are for Donald Trump. Right. They're for the guy that he wants to. He wants Trump to believe that if Trump gets back in power, Trump should call Lindsey Graham, bring him back into the White House, and and for him to be the uh, the voice, the counselor on foreign policy. It is a really good case study uh, in a certain kind of of corruption. Deep, not corruption in the sense of like you know bribery, but it's like the deep, deep sense of corruption of one soul. Will Salton, thank you very much. Thank you.